Hi, this is Ben Constable from Spark Systems, introducing ArcGIS support for Enterprise Architect 9.3. I'll begin by introducing the MDG technology for ArcGIS. That technology includes a UML profile for representing ArcGIS concepts. It gives us a model pattern or template in which we can build up our ArcGIS schema. And it provides new diagram types specifically for visualizing those ArcGIS designs. Using those three capabilities, we'll build a simple model of an ArcGIS schema. We'll model a feature class, a table, and we'll relate those two elements using a relationship class. We'll then expand upon that basic model. We'll include an example of a UML abstract class and some examples of the ArcGIS concept of subtypes. Based on that example, we'll generate an ArcGIS schema for our catalog. So out of Enterprise Architect, we'll export an XML workspace document and import it into our catalog. Finally, we'll reverse engineer an existing ArcGIS schema. Now this can be useful in a couple of scenarios. Firstly, we may have a legacy geodatabase which we need to better understand and therefore visualize before updating. Or our organization may have several geodatabases that simply need to be documented and traceable. By reverse engineering those existing geodatabases into a UML representation, we better facilitate traceability to other analysis and design models. The main operations we perform on an ArcGIS model are available under the Extensions menu under ArcGIS. I can add a model pattern for ArcGIS, import and export a Workspace XML document, I can set the coordinate system for my workspace and adjust certain display properties for the diagrams. We'll begin by adding a new model pattern for ArcGIS. I select the ArcGIS technology and add the ArcGIS workspace. This gives me the template structure in which to build my ArcGIS schema. Notice the package structure that the model pattern has created for us. At the top level we have an ArcGIS workspace that's a UML package. That contains three sub-packages, one for my feature classes, my domains, and spatial reference elements. It also provides an overview diagram, which I'll open now by double-clicking it. The overview diagram provides some guidance on how to build up the rest of my schema by way of its notes, and it also serves as a useful navigation aid, as I can double-click any of these packages to drill down into them. ArcGIS diagrams such as this are to be used in conjunction with the toolbox. Each item in the toolbox represents a concept in the ArcGIS world. For example, a feature data set is represented as a UML package. That's the case for the features package over in the project browser. Similarly, geometric networks, topologies, and even ArcGIS workspaces are represented as a UML package. UML classes are used to represent feature classes in ArcGIS, for example, points, lines, and polygons. Tables and subtypes are also modeled as UML classes. Fields in ArcGIS are represented as UML classes, as are custom indexes. Relationship classes are represented as UML associations or association classes. Now notice the abstract class. Although that's not directly represented in an ArcGIS schema, it can be helpful to logically group our model, and we'll see that later. Finally, note the spatial reference element. This is modeled as a class and allows us to set the coordinate system for our workspace and its elements. We'll now build up our example model, and the example will represent the relationship between houses and smart meters which are used for monitoring electric power consumption. I'll model the house as a point feature class, and I'll do that in the feature data set that the model pattern created for me. I simply drill down into that package and drag and drop the point feature class from the toolbox. Now that creates for me a UML class with stereotype point. Enterprise Architect has also created for me a number of system level fields which I can choose to display on the diagram. Notice these two required fields, the object ID and the shape field, 
as well as the indexes which will help to improve performance on the implemented database. Now I need to customize some UML properties for this class. I'll do that now by accessing the properties dialog. I'll name the feature class as house and apply that change. There are also a number of ArcGIS specific tagged values. These are grouped together under the ArcGIS properties tab. I don't need to set any of these for my simple example model today, but I have available to me such things as the data set ID. I could manually assign that, but I'm simply going to let the exporter assign a random and unique value for me. The OID field name and the shape field name both need to be set, but Enterprise Architect has done that automatically for me when I created the point feature class. The spatial reference information can be overridden at a feature class level. However, I'm going to set that at the feature data set level later. At any point, I can come back to those properties, uh, either through the properties dialog or by using the dockable tagged values window. So all of those ArcGIS specific properties are available to me that way as well. So that's really it for my house feature class. I'm not going to include any fields at this stage in the example. Next, we'll build up the table that represents our smart meter. We'll create a new diagram on which to model our smart meter table. And on that same diagram, we'll show the relationship to the house feature class. We select the ArcGIS workspace in the project browser, click the new diagram icon, and select an ArcGIS diagram type. We'll name it house to meter. And we drag and drop the table or object class from the toolbox onto the diagram. As with the feature class, Enterprise Architect creates a couple of system level fields which we can choose to display on the diagram. Let's edit the properties for our table. We only need to set the name at this stage. I can leave all of the ArcGIS specific properties as default, but I will create a custom field for this table. This field will uniquely identify to which house any given smart meter belongs. I drag and drop the field icon, we'll assign a name of house ID. with type ESRI field type integer and there's my field. That's all I need to set for the custom field. How can I edit the properties of that field if I need to later? I'll simply select it on the diagram, right click and view the properties where I can adjust the name, the type or any ArcGIS specific properties that I may need to set. Now we want to relate the smart meter table to the house feature class we created earlier. We simply drag and drop it from the project browser as a simple link. And you'll notice the namespace prefix highlights for us from which package this house element originates. We model the relationship between the house feature class and the smart meter table using a relationship class. And the profile provides two forms of these. For one-to-many relationships, it's a UML association. Or for many-to-many -many relationships, we use the UML association class. Ours is a one-to-many relationship. Even without the toolbox displayed, we can use Enterprise Architect's Quick Linker to build up this relationship. We double-click the connector to edit its properties. We'll name the relationship house to meter. We then set the source and target role information. The source role indicates that a smart meter belongs to only one house. The target role indicates that a house has zero or more smart meters.
We then set some ArcGIS specific properties. The origin primary key and the origin foreign key. In this model, the origin is our house feature class. Its primary key is the object ID. The foreign key is that custom field house ID which we set in the smart meter table. Now if we were modeling a many-to-many -many relationship, we would set the destination primary key and foreign key. We'd also set the OID field name which would be defined within the association class itself. We've now modelled our house feature class, our smart meter table and the relationship between them. Now we've modelled enough information to generate a valid schema but let's first build upon the example by using some of the inheritance capabilities in the profile. Returning to our features diagram, let's assume there's more than one type of building that can have a smart meter, for example an office. We could use an abstract class to represent the building concept. We'll name that class building. And we can use this class to factor out any of the common fields for this concept. Let's give it a custom field named street address. We'll set the type as Esri field type string. Now we simply generalize from the house feature class to the building abstract class. Now we could ask at this stage, is it really useful to show the system level fields on a diagram such as this? Well, not really. Unless we're customising those fields, it can clutter the diagram. So we'll hide those. Now let's create our office feature class. Again, we generalize to the building feature class. And we can tidy the diagram. Now we have a simple abstract model that shows that a house and an office are both buildings which inherit the common field street address. Now let's assume we need to differentiate houses based on their building material, say a weatherboard versus a brick house. We could use subtypes to do this. Let's create two subtypes now, one for a weatherboard and one for a brick house. We relate the subtypes to the feature class using the subtype generalization connector. And notice that each subtype has a subtype code property. We can set this as a unique identifier of subtypes for a given feature class. We'll set a code of zero for a brick house and one for a weatherboard house. Now in the feature class we can determine which will be the default subtype when we create a new house in the geodatabase. We use the subtype field to do this. We'll name it subtype code. And we can use the initial value to specify which will be the default. We'll select weatherboard. We'll use a field in the feature class to capture the material value. We'll name the field material and leave the type as Esri field type string. 
The subtypes need to reflect fields in the feature class. The easiest way to do that is to drag and drop them from the project browser onto those elements in the diagram. Now we have the opportunity in the subtypes to refine the field type using a coded value domain. We'll create the coded value domain using the toolbox. We'll name it building material. And we'll move it into the domains package to help better organize our model. Now we need two coded values, one for brick and one for weatherboard. The first is being created for us here by this template. The coded value is named my code name and the value my coded value. We can adjust this using the attributes properties dialog. We'll rename it to brick and use the initial value field to specify the value. We'll use BR. We'll create the second coded value, again using the toolbox, and this time for the weatherboard. Again, adjust its initial value, setting a value of WB. We can now use these coded values in our subtypes through the material field. Let's start with brick. We change the material field type to correspond to the coded value domain building material. We select that from the domains package. And then we set the appropriate initial value to correspond to the coded value. In this case, it's BR for brick. Now we do likewise for the weatherboard subtype. Its initial value is WB. Reviewing our model now, we see that the house feature class inherits from the abstract class building. From that class, it gets its street address field. It also has its own custom field, material, which helps us to differentiate houses based on their building type. We have a brick subtype and a weatherboard subtype. And when we create a new house in the geodatabase, it's going to be of type weatherboard by default. That's because the subtype code for our house feature class corresponds to the subtype code of the weatherboard subtype. With the feature class and table completely modeled, all that remains prior to exporting the schema is to set valid spatial reference information for this workspace. Notice the spatial references package in the project browser. That was created for me by the model pattern and it contains a stereotyped element that Enterprise Architect uses to specify spatial reference information. I can create one or more of these spatial reference elements for a given workspace, and it allows me to set one of the predefined coordinate systems that are supported by ArcGIS. Now I link to this element either from a feature data set element or from a feature class if it does not reside within a feature data set. I'm going to make that connection now by editing the properties of my feature dataset package. I access the ArcGIS properties and then locate the spatial reference element. Now I need to configure the spatial reference element itself to point to a valid coordinate system. I select it and use the ArcGIS menu to set the coordinate system. I have available to me the geographic and projected coordinate systems that are supported by ArcGIS. I'm going to choose the WGS 1984 coordinate system. Notice that its 
associated values are automatically populated for me within the spatial reference element. So now my feature data set points to valid spatial reference information. Now I can update this information if needed to change to a different coordinate system, for example. If I do that, again using the ArcGIS menu, any feature data set or feature class that points to this spatial reference element will have its spatial reference information updated automatically. With the model complete, I'll save any open diagrams. And now I'm ready to export into a format that our catalog can read. I select my ArcGIS workspace from the project browser. Then from the extensions menu, choose ArcGIS, export to ArcGIS workspace XML. Notice that ArcGIS is chosen as the XML type. And I export. I can view the resulting XML document in Enterprise Architect and see that my domain coded value is included, the building material along with its coded values, and of course my feature class, house, and its associated fields, including those that were inherited from the abstract class. The next step is to import our generated schema into our catalog. I've created a connection to a local folder, and under that I'll create a new file geodatabase. I'll assign a meaningful name, and now we can use the schema import wizard to bring in the XML workspace document we created with Enterprise Architect. We choose the schema only option, and select our XML document. Next, we're presented with a summary of what this schema includes. We finish off the process, then we can navigate the schema in the Art Catalog tree. Notice our feature classes have been included, the House and Office feature classes, which were based on the abstract class Building. Looking at the House properties, we see the subtypes included. Brick and Weatherboard, with Brick being the default. Under the fields, we have material, subtype code, and street address custom fields. Notice the house to meter relationship class was imported. And let's have a look at the smart meter properties. We see listed the house ID custom field. So that's the basic process for importing our generated schema into our catalog. Returning to Enterprise Architect now, we'll consider a scenario in which we need to import an existing geodatabase schema. We do so from the extensions menu under ArcGIS, import ArcGIS workspace XML. We select the XML workspace document and kick off the process. We'll import this schema into a top level project node. We've just imported the entire gas distribution model that's published by Esri. Opening the workspace diagram, we see that all of the object classes have been imported. In addition to that, the coded value domains. And we can use Enterprise Architect's pan and zoom window to navigate any large diagrams. Also notice that the geometric networks have been included. In addition to that, all of the feature classes have been included, points, lines, and polygons, as well as their relationship to their various subtypes. So this is an extremely useful way of documenting existing geodatabase schemas. And we can link and trace any of these imported elements to any other enterprise architect model elements that we have. And by using a standard UML representation, we can reach a much wider audience. For example, analysts and architects that are not well versed in geodatabase technology can still grasp the underlying concepts and their relationship to a corporate model. In this introduction, we've briefly considered how to model ArcGIS schemas in Enterprise Architect. We looked at the major components of the MDG technology for ArcGIS. 
its UML profile for visually representing ArcGIS elements, the model pattern it provides as a starter structure for our workspace. And we used one of the new ArcGIS diagram types. We built a very simple example model. We related houses to smart meters using a feature class, a table and a relationship class. We then built upon that simple example, including an abstract class and subtypes which used a coded value domain. We then generated our schema to an XML workspace document and imported that into our catalogue. Finally, we've reverse engineered an existing geodatabase schema. That meant visually rendering the schema using the standard UML notation and allowing us to reach a much wider audience.